All right, I think we are ready to begin. Hi everyone, this is Anna from the V-Ray for Revit team. I'm glad to welcome you here to this V-Ray for Revit webinar. Today I'm going to speak about what's new in V-Ray 3.6 for Revit. I really can't wait to show you all new features and improvements this version includes, and I can't wait to hear from you as well. That's why my colleagues are also here with me and they'll handle your questions in the webinar chat panel. So if you have any questions or you want to share some feedback, I strongly encourage you to message us while this webinar is ongoing. Let's not waste more time. I will start with a short intro about V-Ray and the idea behind V-Ray for Revit. Since you're attending this webinar, you probably know or have heard of this. V-Ray has become a time-proven industry standard when it comes to architecture and architectural visualization. 92 of top 100 architecture studios in the world use V-Ray in their everyday work. It is great that we finally have it integrated directly into Revit, so we don't have to deal with any other software platforms anymore, exporting models, rewarding models, and you know how it is. V-Ray for Revit was developed to fulfill these three key characteristics. It is easy, powerful, and fast. We understand that Revit users are people that usually work under tight deadlines. Therefore, they need something that, one, will not consume much of their time, two, will not require any additional learning, which also takes time, and three, will output awesome results. In one word, something super easy. On the other hand, they need a tool that is powerful enough to create beautiful, high-quality images. V-Ray for Revit is powerful. It uses the same V-Ray engine that is used in Max and Maya. We've just optimized the settings and left some of them hidden from the interface, again, to make it easier to use. And it's fast. Not only it renders fast, but also, since it's easy and powerful, it can be set up in a fast way. And we'll see this just in a while. Here is a short overview of what's new in V-Ray 3.6 for Revit. No need to say that 3.6 means that we now have the V-Ray 3.6 core. Next one, the UI has been cleaned up and reorganized. I will guide you through it and we'll explore the changes together. We did lots of optimizations. As a result, Revit to V-Ray scene translation became up to four times faster and the rendering up to one and a half times faster. The new V-Ray Asset browser had replaced the Material browser. It comes with new filtering and selection options and besides materials, it now has the V-Ray proxies and V-Ray for panels. V-Ray Proxies and V-Ray Fur are brand new features in V-Ray for Revit, and I'll speak in detail about them. The GPU rendering has also been improved. We have hybrid rendering as well as GPU production rendering. The Material Editor has a new light theme to match Revit's interface. It has a new and improved color picker as well as new texture maps. Note that these are just the highlights of this release. There are also a number of under-the-hood improvements as well as bug fixes. A full list of them can be found in the release notes section of the V-Ray for Revit documentation page. I'm sure whoever of you have already used the previous version will find a big difference while using that one. Now let's start our detailed walk around the new features. Our first stop is the Smart UI. I remember how I struggled when Revit interface was changed some years ago. Surely no one likes UI changes. Therefore, we tried to make them elegantly and for the better of the user experience. The greatest change is in the settings panel. To make it more speakable to users, we have reduced the number of tabs and reorganized the settings in them. It's time to open Revit and start showing you. Before doing that though, let me tell you a few words about how this webinar is going to continue. We'll start with a walk around the UI, which will be dedicated to all those of you guys that are still beginners. Based on tons of feedback and questions we receive from you on a daily basis, I decided that we should definitely start with this, as many of you consider yourselves beginners when it comes to V-Ray for Revit. 
I'm sure with the new changes with it, this will be interesting for non-beginners as well. So I will walk you through the UI and after that, I'll continue with showing you how to get the maximum by including the new features in your workflow. All the time, I will focus on V-Ray Essentials and will give tips and tricks so that next time you open V-Ray, you'd feel more comfortable with its settings and more confident in general. So let's get started. For the purposes of this webinar, I'm using this Revit Villa model kindly provided by our user Dmitry Kuznetsov. V-Ray for Revit installs as part of the Revit environment. You can find it as a separate tab on the Revit ribbon named V-Ray. After installation, you will see the V-Ray toolbar buttons grayed out like this. Don't worry, it's not broken. This is because your V-Ray for Revit license is not engaged automatically when Revit is launched. You need to click the Acquire License button to activate it. This is very useful in cases where you are planning to share your V-Ray license across multiple computers, as well as in the context of architectural studios where the number of Revit licenses exceeds the number of V-Ray ones, and thus an on and off button is more than necessary. If you want to skip this step, there is an Obtain License on Startup option located on the Licensing tab of the V-Ray Settings dialog. This will automatically obtain V-Ray license every time Revit is started. Once we obtain license, the toolbar buttons become active. Let's move on from left to right and start with the Current View button. Currently, V-Ray settings are stored per project. This means that they work globally for your project. So every time you want to render, you need to select which one of the Revit 3D views you would like to render from the drop-down list over here. Here we have the render button. We will look at the render types later on. And something that is hidden here, but you will find it useful, V-Ray Project Gallery. Here you can find a short history of your rendered images and you can save them directly to your Revit project. The rendered image appears in the V-Ray frame buffer window, shortly we call it VFB. It can be shown or hidden using the next button. Use the quality and resolution settings to set up the size and quality of your image. Moving on to the lighting panel. Revit Sun and artificial lights are fully supported by V-Ray. This button will turn on and off the artificial lights from Revit. While the next one opens this panel, where you can control sun visibility, intensity and size. Note that sun position is taken directly from Revit. To change sun position, use Revit Sun Settings dialog. Here is also an option to illuminate the scene using a V-Ray dome light instead of a sun. This creates an imaginary dome above the entire model. The dome can emit light in different colors or it can be mapped with an HDR image and to emit light based on that image. Use this to create realistic environment around the rendered model. Next option is no light. Use it to turn off the environment light when the artificial lights are turned on. The Asset Browser, it now has vertical tabs. Here you can find a list of all Revit materials and override them with V-Ray ones. Hold on for a few minutes and we will look in detail at the Asset Browser. V-Ray Camera Settings provide control over the camera exposure value and white balance and allow for adding camera effects like bokeh or vignetting. Finally, we have reached the settings window. I told you it's been reorganized in less tabs. In the renderer tab, you can find general settings and optimizations. The most important things here are at the top. You can toggle between CPU and GPU and select which one of them to perform the rendering. The sampler controls the way the image is rendered, i.e. the way we will see it appearing on the screen. Buckets will render it on small square portions named buckets, while progressive will clear the image progressively. I would recommend you to use progressive as it gives more freedom and flexibility. 
Even if the rendering hasn't been completed yet, you can stop it at any time and you have an image. While if you render using buckets, you will have to wait until the very last bucket is rendered. At the beginning, I would recommend you to keep the rest of the settings of this tab to their default values, excluding the autosave. It is clear what it does, right? Simply enable it, specify a path, a file type, and the image you render will be saved there automatically. Moving on to channels tab, or the so-called render elements. If you're familiar with compositing, then this is your tab. If not, just remember the denoiser channel. When enabled, a denoising operation will be performed once the image has been completely rendered. This will smoothen the image, removing the noise. Here is my tip. If you need a fast result, render in low quality with the noiser on. This will save you time and will produce a smooth image. Next one is the Environment tab. Here we have gathered together the atmospheric effects and the infinite ground plane. As their name suggests, you can use the atmospheric effects to simulate fog, atmospheric dust or haze. We'll go back to the infinite ground plane just in a while. Pads and sharing, same for it. I will show you how to take advantage of the options in this tab later on. Swarm is the V-Ray distributed rendering system that allows you to render on multiple machines at once. You have the option not to use your local machine for rendering, which basically means that you can send the render job over to the other machines and continue working using the full resources of yours. Note that to use Swarm on multiple machines, you will need a render node license for each of them. But since Swarm is also supported in Vray for SketchUp and Vray for Rhino, in case you use any of them, you can use them as render nodes. Licensing, we already saw this tab, so I think that's enough to begin with Vray for Revit. Now let's jump back to my presentation and see what comes next. Scene export optimizations. This is something under the hood, yet very important. I hope I'll be able to explain it in an understandable way. We've optimized the way Revit geometries are translated to V-Ray by implementing a smart caching technology. This resulted in up to four times faster scene translation and one and a half times faster rendering. Where did we take these numbers and how do we measure this? Here in our team, we have a large archive of Revit projects of different scale, from a simple house to a skyscraper. Every night, they are rendered with V-Ray and our system compares their render times. We have scenes that behave even faster than the numbers I'm giving you, but on average, this is the expected result. To unveil a little bit more, this can be noticed when rendering complex scenes with iterative objects like curtain walls. Let's say you have a model with a large number of instances, i.e. an element has been copied multiple times. Instead of exporting all instances, V-Ray is now able to take just one of them and multiply it, and thus reducing export times. This can be best seen on the following side-by-side -side comparison. Note the tiny green bar that appears measuring the scene export progress. On the right hand side we have V-Ray 3.6, which in this case appears to be more than two times faster. What comes next is the Asset Browser. Besides that now it has a new name and hosts proxies and for options, we did a few more improvements. The global overrides options have been extended with RPC material override. We've added also multiple selection of materials as well as filter materials by linked file. This is very useful as it allows for overriding linked files materials separately from the Revit project materials or you can do a global override of a linked file only. Let's go back to Revit, selecting the view we will render. After that, we need to set up the quality and resolution. The quality dropdown contains quality presets from draft to very high. Draft is expected to produce fast but slightly noisy results, while high produces smooth results on the expense of longer render times. So I'll keep this to draft and I will jump to resolution. 
Here is how I'll set up the resolution. I want to render my image in the same proportions as I see it in Revit's crop region. Therefore, I'll select crop region resolution. V-Ray will output the image white and height here. Now, in my case, while setting up my render settings, I want to render exactly what I see in the crop region, but in lower resolution. So I'll select custom, then I'll type in the white and height that I already have from the crop region. The white and height define the proportions of the image, right? And proportion means aspect ratio. As we can see, it appears automatically. I will now lock the white and height values. This will keep the ratio locked as well. And changing one of the values will change the other one according to the ratio. Let's set this to 900. This is exactly half HD. Now we are ready to run an initial rendering. We have two options, production or interactive. Production will generate a still image. Interactive will update the image in real time while we'll tweak some of the settings. For example, materials, lighting, camera settings and position, and so on. Depending on the hardware you use, you can select which engine to perform the rendering select between CPU or GPU, or you can actually use them both together, but I'll explain this later on. In this case, I will keep it to CPU and I render in interactive mode so that we can instantly see the changes I'll make. The model now comes with Revit's assets. What I see at first is that it's a bit dark. So the first thing that I'll do is to decrease the exposure value. I know many users were confused with this parameter and thought that the slider was inverted as it says bright sunshine while the image gets darker. Here I'll explain how it works. The greater the value, the less light we let enter the camera and thus the image gets darker. This is suitable for bright and sunny daylight images, while smaller values let more light in the camera and are suitable for interiors or night shots. I'll set this to 13. The white balance works exactly as in a real world camera. Depending on the lights that we use to illuminate the scene, the white color might appear warmer or colder. Starting from it, this affects all colors on the image. The white balance can help you set up the correct white color for your image to make it look natural and realistic. You can try to use it for artistic purposes as well. Now let's say that I'm working under a tight deadline, but my client has just called me to say that he's coming around to see how my progress is going. I'm still at the concept stage, so I need to present my idea without confusing my client with materials and colors that hasn't been set up properly yet. What I'll do is that I'll use the global overrides options. They are great for concept and are super fast to set up. All opaque materials will be overridden with just one. It can be color or it can be a V-Ray material. All transparent materials will be overridden as well. You can play with the color material settings like transparency and reflection. Let's switch to a V-Ray material. And I'll take this one. Now my mockup is almost ready. I just need to override the RPC trees like this. The default color is too bright, so I will change it and a bit darker. And I'll make them slightly transparent. One last thing is that this villa lies on a lake actually. I will use infinite ground plane to create the lake. We already know where to find it. I will enable it, change the color, add some reflection. Note that the infinite ground plane is always locked to the zero level of the Revit project. I think in this case, we need to move it slightly downwards. And here we are. And this took us less than five minutes. I have rendered the image in full HD in advance 
and I will load it from the VFB history panel where you can save in progress images and compare them. Here it is. Now let's go back to the presentation. We've improved the way settings are shared between users. As you can see on this slide, the settings are grouped by category. You can export or load just a specific category using the category checkboxes. The grouping is visible in the import list as well so that you don't get lost in the settings. Let's go back to project and see how this works. I'll change the current view, then going to settings, paths and sharing. Here you can configure also paths to assets. In case you have moved your assets folder to another location, you don't need to remap anything. You just need to add the path to the new location right here. Use the add button to add the path or the remove button to remove a path. This is super useful in case you work in more than one computer or if you share work with your colleagues. Now I want to import the settings a colleague just sent to me. I want only materials, environment and camera settings so I will unmark the rest. Load settings. As you can see only materials, environment and camera were loaded. If you change your mind you can click clear list. In my case I will click import. Let's render. I see the sky is quite bright, so I will increase the exposure value. And the lake has gone, so I will turn the infinite ground plane on. I don't like the water docks color over here, and the dock is actually a linked model. The dock, the chairs, and the lamps around the villa are part of the dock RVT linked model. So now I will show you how linked files filter works. In the filter drop down, you can see that the linked project appears as a separate filter category. And if I select it, I will see only its materials in the material list. I can select all of them and override them together. Or I can drag and drop V-Ray materials over them. Now after we have set up the materials, it's time to take care of the environment on the rendering. The long-awaited V-Ray proxies are finally here. They allow for rendering high-res entourage models. Proxies import geometry from an external mesh at render time only. The geometry is not present in the scene and does not use up any resources. Currently, we are unable to load proxies directly into Revit, the way it is in V-Ray for SketchUp, for example. For that reason, you need to have RPCs in the scene because they serve as stand-ins for proxies. Now, the big question, where to take VR mesh files from? Use the Apply to VR Mesh tool. It is a simple command line tool that converts high poly models into VR Mesh files. The tool comes along with your V-Ray for Revit and can be found under Tools in the V-Ray for Revit folder on your C drive. Here I've prepared a close-up view where I'll show you how to override an RPC model with a V-Ray proxy at render time. In the RPC Proxies tab of the Asset Browser, you can find a list of all RPC families loaded in the current Revit project. Use the Project Filter to show only those of the RPCs that are already placed in the model. In my case, I have only one tree. I will drag and drop a VR mesh file over the RPC. Initially, the tree is loaded with no materials but in random colors, representing its material IDs. The colors can be changed, but I would advise you to use V-Ray materials for realistic results. Change the scale of the proxy to match the scale of the image. You have the option to rotate it as well. One important thing here, since proxies can be exported from different platforms with different units and coordinate systems, they might appear with their vertical axis becoming horizontal or the opposite. 
In such cases, use the flip axis option. Moving on to V-Ray 4. V-Ray 4 allows for rendering realistic grass as well as any kind of fluffy objects like carpets, for example. I've prepared this scene where we have a close-up view of a grass field. Here is how it looks like when rendered. Note that the grass is generated only at render time, we cannot see it in the Revit viewport. Now let's access the V-Ray 4 tab from the Asset Browser. Here you have a list of all materials in the project and you can select which materials to apply for to. This means that if you want to apply fur only to a specific geometry in your project, you need to assign that geometry a unique material, then find it in the list here and apply fur to it. Here you can also filter by linked file. I know the grass is in the current project, so I'll select it. The first three parameters control the density, length and thickness of the first strands. Their values are related to Revit's project units. Changing the units in Revit would change the units of these three parameters as well. To continue, I will use a render region so that we see the changes faster. I will also decrease the density and thickness values and we'll remove the defocus effect so that we can see clearly what happens with the first strands when we tweak the settings. Use the length parameter to control the length of the grass. Taper, we will add taper to each strand. If it's set to zero, the strands will be equally thick from top to base. Obviously, this is more suitable for carpets. As grass strands are thinner at their top, I will set it to 1 or back to 0 0.9. The bend of the strands is controlled by the gravity and bend parameters. Gravity controls the force that pulls first strands down along the z-direction. If it's set to zero, the strands are straight. The same is valid for the band parameter. Note that if I zoom in, the strands appear ribbed. This is because strands are rendered as several connected straight segments and their number is controlled by the knots parameter. If I increase the knots, the strands will be smooth. The Variance options allow for adding variance to their corresponding parameters. Zero means no variance and one is the maximal value. I'll keep them as they are. Now let's focus on the level of detail parameters. I'll set the thickness and density to their initial values. Level of detail is used in cases where we need to generate a large area of fur, just like this grass field. It conserves memory by decreasing the detail at areas that are far away from the camera, where we basically don't need to have detail. We need to set up a start distance, which is measured from the camera. Further from that distance, the level of detail will be applied by decreasing the fur density and increasing strands thickness. The level of detail will be applied at a certain proportion, specified by the rate parameter. In our case, this means that on every 4 meters, the density will be decreased 2 times and the thickness will be increased 2 times. Let's render the entire image. I'll go back to the camera settings and I will set the focus distance to 300. This is the distance from camera at which objects appear in sharp focus when defocus parameter is applied. The defocus simulates a bokeh effect. The higher the value, the blurrier the image will become in all areas except the one at the focus distance. I can close this already and go back to the Villa project. I'll open the Asset Browser, go to Fur tab, type in Grass and I'll enable the grass. 
Now let's render. Our image still needs some enhancements and we can add them from the color corrections panel on the VFB. In this panel, you can apply color corrections to the image. For example, you can compensate the exposure, change the color balance or the hue and saturation and so on. Furthermore, you can save a preset of your color corrections to use it later on or in another project. I will load a preset that I have. Seems a bit overexposed, so I will change the exposure and the hue and saturation just a bit. I will now stop the rendering. I wasn't sure if we will have the time to render the entire image at higher resolution, so I have saved a few images in high res in advance. Let me show you, opening the history panel again, and here it is. Now, if I'm happy with my color corrections, I can go over this tiny button here and copy the entire image to clipboard. It will be copied along with color corrections and I can paste it basically wherever I want. In my case, in Photoshop, but it can be also an email, a chat, social media and so on. Going back to my presentation, where it's time for the GPU improvements. With this version of V-Ray for Revit, you can take advantage of all hardware resources that you have. Until now, production rendering was available only on CPU. Now it can be performed on the GPU as well. We have also implemented hybrid rendering. This allows for using your CPU as a CUDA device. Thus, you can basically take advantage of both your CPU and GPU devices. And as it can be seen on the next video, you can render faster. What comes next is the material editor. It now has this nice light theme to match Revit's interface as well as some other UI improvements. For example, the textures are now grouped into five categories – general purpose textures, utility, 2D, 3D and ray trace textures. The new texture maps that were added are part of the general purpose category, which means that they can be used in many different situations. Let's look at the gradient map. You can use it to create different types of gradients. There are a few presets you can start from, like black and white, RGB, spectrum, or customize your own. The type parameter controls the direction and shape of the gradient. It can be horizontal or vertical or diagonal, etc. The interpolation defines the color transition. If it's set to none, there will be no gradation between colors and basically this will create stripes. You can add as many color points as you want to the gradient. Left click at the point, right click over the point will remove it. Click on any of the gradient points and you can change its color from the color box below or you can position it super accurately using the position parameter. And here is a short video showing a specific situation where we chose to use exactly gradient map. This is an oil refinery project. We wanted to make the chimney pipes look as realistic as possible. They're assigned a V-Ray material, changing the type from horizontal to vertical and the interpolation to none. Now we have stripes. Now let's play with the colors, replacing the black color with reddish and lightening the mid color. So this is how the gradient works. I'm sure you'll find it useful in many cases. Now the temperature map, usually it is used for light sources. Real world light sources have a specific color temperature value, which affects the color of light they emit and is measured in kelvins. With the temperature map, we can specify the exact Kelvin temperature and render accurate and realistic light sources. Here we have this emissive material where the temperature texture is assigned to the emissive color slot. And if we open it, we'll see that the mode is currently set to color. If we change the color, that will basically change the color of the material. But we're interested in the temperature, so let's set the mode to temperature and change the Kelvin temperature to something warm like 3000. 
the lights now appear warmer, we can also increase the color multiplier, which will result in brighter light. Experiment with the settings until you get the desired result. Now let's move on to VR scan. V-Ray for Revit is now compatible with VR scan materials. These are our ready to use photorealistic scan materials. And yes, we really scan them with a scanner. The scanner takes hundreds of images of an existing real world object from hundreds of angles and directions. Basically, it captures the texture information, dimensions, and the most important thing, the unique way how the material reacts to light. This will guarantee that the material will behave like it should under all kind of lighting conditions and you will render out of the box photoreal images. And the best part is that they're super easy to use, just drag and drop. All materials are seamlessly tileable and our current library contains over 650 scanned materials. They're available for download on our website, let me show you. You need to be logged in with your credentials first and then you can find them under downloads. There is a separate VRScan section. As you can see, there are plenty of material types. I will need wood, so let's explore the wood scans. Probably that one. We can click on the thumbnail to see it larger. Looks really good. I will download it. I will also need fabric in gray color. Okay. Now I have this simple interior scene that was created by one of my colleagues. We have this RPC chair that was being replaced with a V-Ray proxy. I will just drag and drop my scans and we will adjust the map size. Note that VR scans use the same controls as V-Ray materials. Therefore, you can change the white and height of the material or rotate it just the same way. Currently, VR scan materials are supported under certain limitations in V-Ray for Revit. You cannot edit them in the material editor which basically means that you cannot change any of their physical parameters, but even like this, they look great enough. And let's see what comes next. Here it is. Coming soon to V-Ray for Revit is V-Ray Cloud. Chaos Group's new cloud rendering service is currently open for a limited number of beta testers. To be among the first to try it, apply for access by simply clicking the cloud rendering button or visit chaosgroup.com slash cloud. We are almost at the end of this webinar, so let's do a quick summary of what we explored together. The redesigned UI contributes to a better and smooth user experience. When it comes to speed, we saw that it's not only about speed optimizations, but also about streamlined tools that allow you to set up a rendering in a fast and intuitive way, without wasting too much time. We also saw that you can set up a rendering depending on the design stage you are currently stuck in. You can render concept models as well as highly detailed images just like the one we currently see. You can boost your images using proxies, fur, camera effects, VR scans, color corrections, and more. You can take advantage of all hardware resources that you have. And now we have a special offer. We have the V-Ray 3.6 trial available for all users who have previously downloaded a trial of V-Ray 3 for Revit. And if you already have a license for V-Ray 3, then you can simply upgrade to V-Ray 3.6 for free. The build is available on the download section of our website. Make sure you're up to date with what's new by checking out our resource hub regularly. For tutorials, help documentation, past webinars, and much more, visit chaosgroup.com slash resources. Once again, stay tuned by visiting our official website, chaosgroup.com regularly. Our help documentation can be found at docs.chaosgroup.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel Chaos Group TV to watch video tutorials and learn more about V-Ray. You can follow us on social media as well or join our forum where you can meet like-minded professionals and share tips and tricks. 
Your feedback is extremely valuable for us as it is the thing that pushes us forward. Therefore, we would love to hear from you anytime. Thank you for joining this V-Ray for Revit webinar. It was great to have all of you here. Enjoy your V-Ray for Revit and see you soon. Bye-bye.